Just while we continue to receive your offering this morning, I just remind you that for those of you who, uh, who do have or even don't have the Grace app, it's really useful to have it, especially right now in this month. When you open our app on the top right-hand corner, there's a Christmas at Grace button that when you press, everything unlocks, including like digital invites so you can share with people and share to social media all the information about the service times and the Christmas Eve times. Everything's all in there. Even that whole unleashing generosity with our year-end giving, there's a button you can click on that so you can give 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can give online. But that's a really useful thing to have. And so when you've utilized all of your invitation cards that you'll take today, that pile you will take, you're never going to run dry because you can just open the app and you can share it with people digitally. It'll go straight in their calendar and it's probably more effective anyway. Are you all good? So utilize that. We've put some work into it. It's worth it. All right, here we go. This year's series for Christmas I called Fearless. It started last week. If you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to go online and watch and listen to last week's message because it gives context to the whole series. Because I was asking the question, what's going to be a theme this Christmas when I preach on this year after year after year after year after year? And so as I was preparing for it, I was just reading through myself through the gospel narrative of the Christmas story and trying to read it afresh and hear and see. So what is the message that we need need to be hearing this year? And on four occasions, four occasions, this phrase appears, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. On four occasions, four separate occasions, four different people stroke groups of people, hear the phrase, do not be afraid. Be fearless, in other words. Which we know relates to strongly Isaiah 41.10, which was my verse for the year and my word for the year was fearless. So I started 2019, my first message of the year, with this fearless message. And it appears that I need to end it with fearless. Isaiah 41.10 says, do not be afraid or do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So significant. Just a reminder, people wanted to remind some of you on this. When you read the scriptures, so the Bible has two covenants, Old Covenant, New Covenant, Old Testament, New Testament. The last 25% of a printed Bible is the New Testament. It starts with the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, known as these gospels that write about, really, it's a biography of Jesus' life on earth. And these four guys, inspired by God, are to record this biography of Jesus, but the Lord inspires them to write it with a bit of a filter, an emphasis. And Matthew always is posturing and he presents the word of Jesus and who Jesus is because he's pointing to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah King. Jesus is king, which is why Matthew opens with a whole lineage of these, the past generations that Jesus is in a line of King David. There's a Jesus is king, Messiah king, conquering king. Mark, when he writes it, the shortest of the gospels, has a posture that, yeah, Jesus may be king, but he was a servant. He was humble. And he served, and you'll see the the human engagement that Mark leans us into, that filter of Jesus, yes, being king, but he was a servant king. And then Luke, when he presents who Jesus is, he's presenting over and over again that Jesus is man, but he is sinless and perfect. And he engages with the the humanity of that perfect sinless. That's why Luke talks about the parable of the lost son, He's the one who records that. There's emphasis on Jesus being human, but perfect, sinless. There's a posture of he's that perfect 
man. And then John, when he emphasizes and he's writing about Jesus' life, he clearly defines, oh, Jesus is not just a perfect man. He is God. He is the Son of God. He starts out John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He leans in that Jesus is the Son of God, fully divine. So when you read in your Bibles and you're reading an account, a certain section of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, when you have that filter on it, it's pretty incredible. I mean, you could even color code that. That's another week, I'll talk about it. And how it relates to the high priest. Anyway, get off my piece, here we go. So it's rich, that's what I'm saying, it helps. See that. And that relates to last week when I talked about Mary, it was from the Gospel of Luke. And today I'm going to talk about Joseph, wow, surprise, from the context because we hear more about Joseph in the Gospel of Matthew, King Leia. Remind you again, we live in two realms. There is a heavenly spiritual realm and there's an earthly realm and there is battle engaging in both realms and they interact with each other. There was an unseen battle on the cross that Jesus died for us on but there was an unseen battle even in the Christmas narrative. There's an unseen battle in Bethlehem. There's an unseen battle taking place all along and I talked about that last week. The Christmas story, as we, oh, we really read it, I took this out of the way, I don't know what's going on. I had issues in the first service. All right. I don't know what I'm doing. That'll do. I can feel something, but anyway, here we go. So, ready? There you go, commercial break over, here we go. The Christmas narrative, when you read it in its pure form, is very dangerous, uncivilized, not sanitary at all. It is rough, it is wild, it is dangerous, it is perilous. God wants to come into the world in his son Jesus and he sends Mary and Joseph on a 90 mile hike over five days to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Not an easy journey and she's pregnant. The whole thing is just like, really? What is going on? There's an oppressive regime. The Roman Empire is ruling and is dominant. The whole thing is very unsafe and and Jesus, the whole story is not nice, little, neat, tidy. It is wild and raw. And today when I was thinking about Joseph all this week and all preparation for this, I've been struck with a quote by um, Irwin McManus lately that he said this one quote for a couple of years now. He's elaborated and it's been reverberating in me. I shared it with our elders a couple of weeks ago. I shared it with my staff leaders this week. And here's the quote. It'll be on screen for you over three slides. Your freedom is on the other side of your fear. Your greatness is on the other side of your pain. And your future is on the other side of your failure. Now this is profound and it's rich and it's, it's Joseph all over. And it's you and it's me. You see, the reality is we want to find freedom in life, but guess where it is? It's on the other side of your fear. It's not by running away from it. It's not by going around it. There is fear. It's real. But freedom is found on the other side of it. We'll see Joseph encountering fear. But freedom's on the other side of it. Your greatness is on the other side of your pain. And so when pain comes, you can go, oh, it's not fair. And that's okay to say that. But your greatness is found on the other side of your pain. And your future, your destiny is on the other side of your failure. There's destiny and future to be found there. There is a dying to self, hello. It's where it's found. So let's read Matthew chapter 1. Let's read from verse 18. I'm going to read it. I'll go straight through to verse 25 and then pick out some verses as we go back, engaging in this fearless, engaging in this guy Joseph and him becoming fearless and what got him there, but I want to really engage with you and what it is to live 
fearless for you to engage a reality that your freedom is on the other side of your fear and your greatness is on the other side of your pain because your future's on the other side of your failure. Matthew chapter one, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. We'll come back to that because it's massive what takes place there. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. You've probably heard that, read that a lot over the years. There is so much going on. I know we do not have time to cover it all. But let me just start straight away. It says in verse 18, Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Here's the context and culture. In those days, this is in the Mishnah, in some Hebraic writings and rule books, it says this. If you are pledged, engaged, betrothed, if you commit adultery in that season, it is worse than committing adultery when you're married. That culture then, that betrothal, that promise, that engagement, that season there, if you committed adultery in that time, it was worse than, and the missioner would say, you deserve punishment, which would be the woman. She would deserve punishment, and that punishment was public, disgraceful, stoning to death. She is found to be with child, not her fiancés, therefore she should be due the punishment that is stoning publicly, disgracefully to death because they violated, she violated a promise, a pledge, a betrothal. That's, the reality was so, so rich and that's what's going on. So then we hear briefly, there's this whole thing about, oh, okay, so to Joseph it says, but because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. The word zealous is in some writings. Just a God-honoring guy. Because he was that, and he didn't want to expose her to that public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. What's going on there? I don't get it. It sounds like he's bailing. No, he's protecting her. He's protecting her, totally protecting her. Because what the quietly side is, it's like, look, we'll end this. She's no longer engaged. Therefore, she's not breaking this betrothal. No longer engaged. He saves her life. He has in mind to save her life. He is righteous and holy and he cares. How can we avoid this? He just thinks logically, he's a guy, he's looking at a problem, looking for a solution. He already knows he's gonna face himself, his identity, the public disgrace, the whole humiliation of the whole thing. But because he was a righteous, zealous, amazing guy, he's thinking, I want to protect her. I want to protect her. What Joseph does right here before the angel appears, is he offers Mary his own strength. He steps right in between her and all that's gonna come at her, and he says, I'll take it on the chin. I'll take it. He steps in to save her. I'll take it. 
I'll count the cost. I'll do whatever it says. I'll make sure that this, she's not going to be killed. I'm going to step in. He's prepared to take on all the suffering, the humiliation, the disgrace of that moment. Remind you of somebody? Let me just get into this really practically. People have opinions of it. My opinion of it is obviously the right one. <laughs> I'm open-handed. Any men out there, I need to lean in here strongly, real strong. When you read this, and every time I'm reminded of it, it's like a big mirror's put in front of me and says, Des, do you have what it takes? Are you man enough in this situation? What's the calling here? I'm just saying out of all the books that are written towards men, the one that has radically infected me and affected me and affected people for many, many years and gone forward the whole thing, whether you like it or not, you need to read it. Even if you don't like it, read it. It's called Wild at Heart, John Eldridge. And if you've not read it for a long time, reread it. But here's the calling of every man, every man at the heart of it. Every man is called and destined that we have a battle to fight. We have a battle to fight. We engage in a battle. Some of you men are being pathetic and passive and weak and impotent right now. In God, I mean. You're not engaged in the battle. You're passive. You're paying somebody else to do the work for you. You got dismissive. Whatever. You're playing the victim card. You have a battle to fight. You have an adventure to live. I mean, talk about Joseph's life. Talk about a battle to fight and an adventure to live. And every guy, if you've been given this gift by God, if you've been given a beauty, then you are to rescue her daily. You have a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. And I read and I look at Joseph and I go, he is the Olympic gold medalist at these three things. It's phenomenal. Let me lean into some of you men. Men, when was the last time in your prayer time you said to God, okay, God, put me in the battle. Where do you want me? And he might say, you're in it, Des. Will you fight? When's the last time you prayed to God? So God, where do you need me to bring your strength into my children? Where do you need me to bring your strength into my marriage? Where do you need me to bring your strength into fill in the blank? Where do you need me to do that? When's the last time you prayed that way? But some of you are not praying that way because you're flat out scared. Men, there is a battle to fight. Get in the fight. The reality across the Western world is that there are, women are all clapping right now, the reality across the Western world is this, in the church, it is the women who are taking forward the kingdom of heaven more than men. Statistically proven. Proven. It's the women praying harder and longer. It's the women stepping into uncomfortable environments. It's the women wanting to go deeper in their walk with God. Statistically, the women are outnumbering the men when it comes to being warriors. Now, I think that's awesome. I'm not wanting women to back down. I'm like saying, keep it going, women, you're awesome. But men, step up. Step up. There was a righteous, zealous man who was faced with a situation and even in his humanity was like, I'm going to engage this fight. Where do I go here? This is before he's encountered God's angel. But he's stepping up and he's stepping in. And he was rescuing his beauty even at his own expense. And then it says... But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, 14 generations before, David, Joseph, remember your story. Do not be afraid. Thanks for that. Because I am. Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. I got you, is what he's saying. Do not be afraid. I'm going to tell you this. I'm, I think, I think, Joseph in the whole dream encounter of all of this, 
He's hearing this angel of the Lord saying, do not be afraid. And he's, re he's reminded, he's a righteous guy of Isaiah 41.10. Do not be afraid. Oh, I heard you say that once, God. Do not be afraid. Joseph, I'm with you. I'm with you. Do not be dismayed. Do you think he's dismayed? Yep. I am your God. Hey, Joseph, I'm going to strengthen you. And I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Okay. Take her home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit and she will give birth to a son and you, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Let me just, listen. Joseph, you're the one that will place your right hand on this child and you will name him. And his name is his job description. His name is his identity and his destiny. You are going to be the savior of the world. You are going to save people from the sin. And Joseph gets to do that. He's the one. This is your mission, Joseph. There will be a day a few months from now, and I want you to be involved with that. And as fast forward, you can go into more moments when they have the naming thing in the temple. It's another story. But he gets to do that. You get to do that. You get to make a declaration. Now, the unseen and the seen realm. The dragon, a revelation story, the whole thing. Mary's pregnant. How can he stop this from happening? I know, this is not going to happen. She'll get stoned to death. Deal. Nope. A righteous zealous follower of God hears from the Lord and says, no, I will rescue. I will step in. Joseph demonstrates what it is to be fearless. Now, for us guys, what that looks like, it's for women as well. Fearlessness needs courage, but courage alone is not enough. You need courage and commitment. Courage and commitment. One is a gift from the Lord if you receive it, courage. Commitment is your obedience to the Lord. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the absence of self. Let it land a minute. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is not, oh, I'm not scared anymore. Big deal. It's like, what? Courage says, it does not matter what I think and feel. It's the absence of self. This is right. This is righteous. Courage is the ability to be surrendered and self-sacrificing to engage in that. I've had moments this week where this has been trialed and tested in my own soul. I've had moments of incredible teaching from very wise people on this whole, how courageous am I or not? Incredible people, called my wife. Anyway, moving on. And I've been like, wow. Courage is the absence of self, Des. Come on. Now, commitment comes in here. Commitment will change your life. On the other side of your fear is freedom. The other side, commitment is I'm gonna keep going. Commitment says this is where it is. Anybody will know it in the practical. You want to lose weight, it's going to take commitment. When all, we all want the pill, take it, wake up in the morning, it's all good. Anything in life that is a strengthening and a breakthrough is commitment. Commitment helps you to overcome obstacles when they come. But your commitment is tested. Every day. Now, the decision of courage is this. Do you want to receive it? Because the root word of the word courage is the same root word for the Spirit of God. The very breath of God breathed into Adam's nostrils in Genesis, that very breath of God, same root word for the word of the Spirit of God is ruach. And so what you have is a very root thing. So what made Adam alive was the Spirit of God, not oxygen. He then became alive because he was fully alive because he was alive in God because the spirit of God was in him. So courage is the receiving of God's spirit and you leak and so the scriptures say, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. 
There's a daily action there. We need courage, but courage can be gifted to you by the Lord, the indwelling power of his spirit. Now, do you have the commitment to walk in it? We live and we're engaged in a battle that we need to fight. Let me just lean into a practical of the two realms this week. You can dismiss it as being just, oh, it's just the way it is, but I don't think so. The reality is in recent weeks, we as a church are trying to reposture and repivot to really be unleashing grace everywhere we possibly can. At the same time, when you start to engage some dark spaces and dark places, you start to see breakthrough in people's lives. Do you think the enemy goes, oh, leave them to it? No, he doesn't. Here's a stone cold reality of all of this. Just this week alone on Thursday evening, 5.30, we had some vandalism on this campus. The vandalism was not like life changing, but it was just a, uh. some people came onto the campus, we didn't see them, but they, they slashed all the tires of our facilities truck, smashed the windows in it, then went to our passenger vans and smashed windows on that, and then went to one of the school staffs, their car got vandalized, and then to add to that, we then had somebody who had been at our People Help Counseling Center, came out of their time where they're being helped and nurtured to go to their vehicle with a window smashed. You see, the enemy says he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to rob you of your joy. He wants to take away that. And when you start to advance the kingdom, when you start to go at this, our freedom is on the other side of your fear, little things come. And those little vandalism moments were financially a pain, but they made me just a little bit ticked. But it's an okay ticked. But you see, we could go, oh, it's just not fair. All these different things to pay for and blah, 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 blah. It's just not fair. Or we can go, we see what you're trying to do. We see what you're trying to do. But you see, God's people and go, is that it? We can fix that. Is that the best you got? We can fix that. Just a little aside, I want to encourage you, from your generosity, guys, through the On The Move campaign that we did as well, and our preschools meet in the F building, and uh, the AC system wasn't working. Well, more importantly, the heating wasn't working, which is fine in July. But in December, I think you want your three-year-old to be warm. Agreed? And uh, we were like, how are we going to find this? And and straight... And we looked, and there was from your generosity, there was an amount left in that On The Move campaign that paid for that whole repair. And this week, the whole thing got finalized and done. And the three-year-olds and four-year-olds are sat in a warm room right now, praise the Lord, because of what you did. Now, you think it's kind of there. Where is this? You see, we have a bit of a celebration, and then the same day that's all finished, we then have this bit of vandalism. It's like, really? What's going on? Those of you who saw a section of the wall on the north side of the campus that's not there, that just collapsed and there's a whole big other section leaning. And we're not a tourist attraction like Pisa. There's a leaning thing going on there. It's like, what's going on? And we got the bills and we got the quotes. It's a significant amount of thing. It's $60,000, church, to fix a wall. And you go, it's just money though, we agreed. It's just money. But we're not going to let these things hinder us. Your generosity, there's some practical side to giving. You see, when we give, we engage in a battle. It's just like, okay, Lord, I'm in. It's like, I'm in. So this is what I get to be part of. I mean, I'm not going to allow any delay of discomfort. I'm not going to allow like a wall and vandalism to hold us back. I'm going to say to the enemy, enemy, my Lord paid everything for me. I'm going to give. And we're going to overcome in that. So I'm calling for some of you today is actually step up in some generosity. Like exponentially, just be ridiculously generous. And it sends a message into the heavenlies. Look, I'm, I'm letting go. If Joseph can step in, can step in in this way, I'm going to step in and send one back. God has called us 
to unleash his grace. And when you look at Joseph and what he did, there's this beautiful verse right down. He hears it. This is what I want you to do, Joseph. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home to be his wife. Why why do we need? He heard it and he did it. Courage needs commitment. He heard it and he did it. He prayed and he obeyed. He stepped in in every way, knowing there was a huge cost in all kinds of different ways. We get a very minimal amount about Joseph's life. There's a fact to the matter is he is dead before Jesus starts performing miracles on this earth. We don't know the full story of where it was at, but it's just like, wow, he steps in. It's just incredible the amount of things that go on. But he says, and he did what God said. How are you doing on that? How are you doing on the courage and the commitment? How's that going? Husbands, how's that going? I said, husbands, how's that going? With a gift. Dads, how's it going? Brothers, friends, fellow students, college roommates, how's that going? Speaking to the men right now because I am speaking to the men. Mary's already proven her strength. How's that going? He did what the Lord commanded you. And you might feel a little overwhelmed right now. And the Lord would say to you, do not be afraid. I'm with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Do you want it? Breath of God. Courage is the absence of self, not the absence of fear. I will strengthen you and help you because your freedom is on the other side of your pain. Trust me with that. Your greatness, so your freedom is on the other side of your fear. Your greatness is on the other side of your pain. Trying to avoid pain is basically saying, I don't want to gain strength. Avoiding pain is to avoid strengthening. In every sphere of life, you see that. Do we like that plan? No, but it's the truth. And your future is on the other side of your failure. Will you die to self? Will you do that? I will strengthen you. I'll help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Emmanuel, God with us. There's a slide that I'll put up which is related to this, your freedom is on the other side of your fear and I use the word, the symbol of greater than. Do you believe that freedom is greater than your fear? Because if you think that fear is greater than freedom, there's your problem. Do you believe that greatness is greater than your pain, what God has for you? And do you believe your future is greater than your failure? You may have messed up, but do you believe your future is greater than? Why? Because my God is greater than. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. He is greater than. Our God is great. When we sing, oh, come, let us adore him at this season, who is it you are adoring? He is your king, your servant king, your sinless, perfect king. He is the king of kings. He is the son of God. Who is it you are adoring? Do you have that mindset of a warrior, majestic king in the throne you are bowing down to? Oh, come, let us adore him. You're not adoring a little selfless little newborn child, you are adoring God's destiny. And your freedom is on the other side of your fear. Your greatness is on the other side of your pain. Because your future is on the other side of your failure. Oh, come let us adore him. Christ the Lord Adonai.
Okay. This is where I freestyle. I have an option and I did it. Here we go. What are we going to do now? Not yet, but in a short while, we're going to receive the communion elements. You see, the bread and the cup, such symbols of freedom. But Jesus in the garden cried out to his father, if there's another way, if there's another way, bring it. Yet not my will, but yours be done. His humanity faced it. And he realized that his name is he will save us. He knew that greatness for his kingdom was in, on the other side of his pain. And those elements are so symbolic with that. But this is what I feel really strongly. I'm going to ask the men and give the men the invitation to step up. In this season, whatever it is, guys, as, as, as David was sharing on the video before, what is holding you back? What is blocking your heart? What condition and behavior is annoying you? Maybe you're more short-tempered than you want to be. Maybe you're faithless. Maybe what, what is it that's going on? And, and for us guys, it's there. And you're like, Des, we're having this conversation with women in the room. I'm like, yeah, because guess what the number one sin of all men is? Pride. Agreed, guys? Oh, no, 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 I'm okay. I would be remiss in not providing an opportunity for us to receive his courage and for you to make a commitment to walking that way, for you to say, Lord God, I'm kind of glad I wasn't Joseph, but if you need a Joseph, I'm in. I'm in. And so I'm going to ask this. In, 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 in a moment, we're going to have a, a, an old Christmas song that is much more reflective, and the lyrics are very rich. It's O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and Ransom. In other words, I'll pay the price for my people. What about you guys? Something rich in there. And so I'm going to ask right now, if some of the guys right now, you just go, you know what? I'm not satisfied with how I'm living right now. In Christ or maybe I'm outside of Christ, I'm not satisfied. It's time for me to step up. It's time for me to step in the gap. It's time for me to receive his courage, which is his Holy Spirit, and with commitment move forward. So if you're a male in the room right now and that is you, I need you to stand up. I'm going to count to 10 in my head and that will be your window. Okay? So if that's you, men, I need you to stand up. Okay. Women, look around. These guys are going to step up. Keep them to their word. Hold them accountable. You ready, guys? I'm standing with you. I'm not satisfied at all. There's too many times when I've been passive and apathetic and excuse-driven. I know why me. Stop it. Agreed? So, fellow warriors... Let us pray together. Guys, put your hands out like that. Surrendered. Lord Jesus, we come to you and we say, fill us with your courage. Holy Spirit, into every single bone and vein in our body, we need your courage. Spirit of God, fill us. And we stand here and we declare, Lord, would you help us reveal to us where we have blockages? We surrender right now. But we make a commitment. We make a commitment to be obedient to your call on our lives. 
as husbands, as brothers, as friends, as work colleagues, as warriors for Christ, we make this commitment to you. And may we live out of the overflow of your spirit, not our own strength, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We receive. And Lord, we declare right now, we are sorry. We repent. We repent of our pride. We repent of all sin, but our pride, Lord, we repent of our pride. We return to you. We thank you for your forgiveness. And in the name of Jesus, I commission these men on the cause of Christ and the advancement of his kingdom in every sphere of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, that'll probably step one, check your bank account. Step two, check your physical health. Step three, get on your knees, get in his word and praise him daily and equip yourself for his cause. You guys can all be seated. The, uh, the ushers will come and start serving the elements if you would. We're going to be just singing his reflection. Sit down. This old come, old come, Emmanuel. And just start going through that and dwell on it and listen and join in and posture yourselves and be reminded that your freedom's on the other side of your fear. <laughs> your greatness on the other side of your pain and he's paid it for you in Jesus' name. And, and by all means, when you've got those elements, if you're a follower of Jesus, just whenever you want to, just whenever you're ready there, sit down, have a moment. Maybe with a friend or whatever near you, just have a moment, pray for one another. And go ahead and take the bread and the cup anytime during this song at all. But thanks, April leaders, in this song.